recap last week, we went through some of the descriptions of um, Aisha Radilanha's home, you know, what her home life was like. Uh, we also spoke about what the various, uh, I guess, roles or the dynamic between Aisha Radilanha and the Prophet وسلم, was, you know, and the various kind of um, roles that she played in that marriage. And mashallah, a lot of sisters had highlighted quite a few good things. We will mention them today. We said, didn't we, that of course she was a wife. <clears throat> so there was a wife and husband um, dynamic. There was also the mentor and mentee dynamic. Uh, she was also very much a friend, right? There was a friendship dynamic to their marriage. Um, also, she was a witness and a companion, right? Uh, companion as in the, one of the Sahaba, of course. So she was literally a witness to the Sunnah, right? Um, also, she was a cause of revelation, right? There were instances when she was a cause of revelation. One of the interesting things that I've been researching is what was Aisha Radilanha's response and her attitude towards the hijab? right like how did that how was the hijab revealed and then um you know what was her attitude and then after the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when women would come right because you can just imagine right aisha radiallahu she's in medina people visit makkah and medina right and imagine if you were there at the time and you'd heard that uh, the mother of the believers was in medina you would want to visit her, wouldn't you? You'd do what you could to visit her. So, um, subhanAllah, such was the situation of Aisha that people always wanted to visit her, especially women. And so, inshallah, uh, I decided that the next session, we're actually going to dedicate it to the hijab and Aisha Radiran's um, attitude to towards the hijab and the way she used to, I would say, exalt women who came to her, who visited her from all across Arabia and wherever Islam was spreading, right? When she saw them not observing hijab properly sometimes, right? What was her attitude? What did she use to, how did she used to respond? Because subhanAllah sisters, we can learn so much <clears throat> SubhanAllah sisters, we can learn so much from the Sahabiyat and especially from Aisha radila anha in the way, in their attitude, right? And their mindset towards certain aspects of the deen. And then it should be our aspiration to internalize that same mindset, right? Because they are our, our ultimate role models. So today, so next time we're going to focus on the hijab and Today I wanted to first of all tie up some loose ends, some narrations and things that I felt like I missed out or I should have mentioned that I think are important or that you know should be part of any class teaching about Aisha Radilanha. Uh, one of the famous ones is this, and, and this one obviously took place before her Rukhsati, before she uh, consummated her marriage and lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when she used to play with little dolls, right? And um, in this hadith in Sahih, <coughs> in Sahih al-Bukhari, she says, I used to play with dolls in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's Messenger entered my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. Uh, the playing with the dolls, okay, so, and, and the commentator is saying that the playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl. Okay, so anyway, the point from this hadith is, of course, the Prophet ﷺ was married to Aisha, right? So she's his wife even though they're not living together. So he would uh, 
come to Abu Bakr's house and obviously they had that kind of free kind of relationship, right? Um, but from this hadith, which is quite well known, uh, some of the scholars derive the ruling that although in Islam, you know, um, making images and making pictures of living things is forbidden, right? When it comes to children, okay, the, the ruling is different, okay? So some of the scholars, they said that uh, because Aisha Radiyah played with dolls, and this was not seen as something negative, um, of course, the dolls in those days would have been quite crude, you know, they wouldn't have had like these uh, very, very realistic dolls or anything like that. But still, it was, would have been something that represented a living thing, right? Um, <clears throat> so, the scholars said that when it comes to children, the ruling is slightly different, you know? So it's okay for them to have, you know, images even, right? So like when we have books, for example, with, pe with images of people in them for children, that would not be the same as, you know, um, an adult drawing a picture, for example, or creating a sculpture or a statue or something like this, right? So anyway, I just thought that was an interesting, um, you know, observation of some of the scholars. Um, another point that I uh, feel needs to be mentioned, I'm not sure if I mentioned it last time, is that in the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sa'ad ibn Ubada, so one of the Ansar, he provided the food for the wedding. And it was like a dish of food that he had sent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's, it's really... Um, Quite inspiring reading about Sa'ad ibn Ubada. He was the head of the Khazraj tribe and <clears throat> and of course that is the tribe, <coughs> excuse me, he was the head of the Khazraj tribe and of course that is the tribe that was related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And he attended the second pledge of Aqaba he was the only Ansari who was tortured by the people of Mecca. Okay, uh, the Quraysh had heard about the pledge, you know, the pledge uh, before the Hijrah, when people had come for Hajj, the Aus and Khazraj, some members of them had come for Hajj as well. And uh, at Mina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, and you know, uh, while they were there, he had uh, made a pledge with them. And so some of them were still staying at Mina. And when the Quraysh heard, they captured Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and they tortured him. Uh, he was known for being very generous, especially when it comes to food. But SubhanAllah, he was so generous, he was always giving food. They said he used to have some, some sort of open buffet or something outside his house, um, available for people to come and take food. SubhanAllah, right? And so it shows you that because of his generosity, he was also given the honor of being the one who, you know, uh, provided the food for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wedding. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a special dua for Sa'ad and his family, his wife and family, because of this trait of theirs, you know, this trait of being so generous and giving food in particular. And, you know, it shows us, doesn't it, that we should be uh, competing with one another to be the providers of food, you know, to, to others. SubhanAllah. I also wanted to mention how the Prophet ﷺ was related to the Ansar. You see, these types of little details, they might seem like, well, what, what have they got to do with Aisha Radilanha, right? But you see, they help us to contextualize what's happening, you know? So, uh, you know, when you know that somebody is related to someone and you hear about their, having, them having a discussion, that discussion becomes different, doesn't it, than if you didn't know that they were related, right? Um, SubhanAllah, like even just like me, sometimes when I'm interviewing people on the Elmfield podcast, somebody who's a good friend of mine, 
and we might talk in quite a robust way back and forth and then people will sometimes comment that you know it sounds sister fatima you were you were interrupting the guest or you know you should have listened better or something like this and it's usually because they don't know that we actually we're actually friends right from before we have a history we have a relationship right and so the context of somebody being related to somebody changes things doesn't it right so i just wanted us to kind of be aware of some of the ways in which the sahaba were related right to one another so the prophet sallallahu alaihi was related to the ansar how well you know obviously the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is from banu hashim right and uh in the khazraj uh, there is a tribe, uh, Banu Adi ibn an Najjar. And the Prophet Sallallahu father is Abdullah, grandfather Abdul Muttalib, and then great grandfather is Hashim, right? So Hashim, this Hashim, he uh, actually married a woman from the Khazraj tribe, right? From the Banu Adi ibn an Najjar, who are from the Khazraj. And uh, that woman was the mother of Abdul Muttalib, right? So because of that, uh, the Banu Adi were considered the maternal uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And obviously that is what had created the kind of affinity between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Ansar, right from the beginning, like even before they had accepted Islam and even before they had accepted him. That is what made them more kind of, I would say, more amenable and more and soften their hearts, right? Towards him. Um, and, and, and that's why they wanted him to come and help them solve their differences and the wars they've been having for so many years between each other, etc., etc. right? So that's an important uh, thing to mention. And so uh, a few other descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu's house that I found. It's actually a brilliant book. If I can find it. Um, that I found all about the Prophet Sallallahu's house. Inshallah, I will bring it next time. Um, so we know that the Prophet Sallallahu purposefully lived a very austere life, right? He lived that austere life, not because it's haram to have good things and luxurious things, but because he chose not to, okay? And we're going to talk about that later um, in the incident regarding you know, the choice that he gave his wives. In his house, there was a bed frame. This is from a hadith, right? There was a bed frame. There was some sort of matting. There was a leather pillow filled with fiber, a piece of leather hung to a hook, a water skin, a bucket for water and dates, and a bowl for drinking water. Those were some of the simple things that the Prophet wasallam owned and Aisha owned. Aisha Radilana tells us about the kind of lifestyle of the Prophet wasallam that Sometimes they would spend 40 nights in succession without burning an oil lamp or having anything to give light. Now just think about that, subhanAllah. What that means is that basically, you know, their lives would have been very much run by the, uh, basically the, the rhythm of, the natural rhythm of day and night, right? Uh, so when it becomes dark, any, any of you have ever been camping, right? <laughs> you know that, subhanAllah, when it starts getting dark, you start panicking, right? Because you start thinking, oh my God, you know, very soon it's going to be dark. We better get the torches out. We better get the lamps out. We, we can't really relate to that way of life because subhanAllah, we, we're used to artificial light, right? We can stay up all night if we want. We can work all night, uh, which is quite unhealthy. Uh, so, you know, obviously this is actually a more 
healthy way of life, right? Living according to the uh, to the sun, the daylight and the night, right? Sleeping at night and getting up in the day, the crack of dawn and working throughout the day. But it kind of also shows you that, you know, oil was like a expensive or a seen as a type of luxury in those days, right? And there would be times when they didn't burn an oil lamp or have anything to give light. SubhanAllah. Um, there is a wonderful uh, little anecdote or story that I found that uh, the Tabi'i Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, who is one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. So in the generation after the Sahaba, there were seven uh, scholars who were considered to be like the real knowledgeable scholars, right? And who used to give, you know, judgments. They were like judges. Uh, one of them is Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. And when the house of Aisha Anha during the time of the Khalif Walid ibn Abdul Malik, right? So in the Umayyad times, when um, the house of Aisha was going to be dismantled, okay, because, you know, they had to expand the masjid, they wanted to rebuild certain aspects, and subhanAllah, he actually said to the Khalif, he said, I wish you didn't have to destroy this little room and the people could be content with what they have. Thus, future generations could understand what kind of life the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was pleased with, even though he had in his hand the key to the world's treasures. SubhanAllah. And this is in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad. SubhanAllah, he, you know, he actually, just as last, last, in the last couple of sessions, you know, when we were looking at the um, house of Aisha, we were looking at the pictures, just as it kind of moved us, right? It moved us. Just one minute. I don't know, there's a, there's a sound. I just need to wait till the sound goes. something outside the window. If it doesn't go, I'm just going to carry on. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, can you hear me sisters? Just want to check in with you. You hear that sound? It's coming out from the window. <laughs> Something really loud outside. Oh, <laughs> it's fainter now. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, you know, just as in the last couple of sessions when we were looking at the house of Aisha, it kind of moved us, didn't it? It made us think, oh, subhanAllah, how simple they lived, how simply they lived. And, and those were just reconstructions, right? And models of what the house of Aisha would have looked like. The Tabi'i, and great scholar Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he had such foresight, he was actually saying to the Khalifa, I wish you could just leave it because when people come here from all over the world and they come and see, and they could come and see what the house of the Prophet ﷺ was like, they would be thankful for their own homes. They'd be thankful and they would realize what this world is all about, right? They'd realize that the best of creation, the man who could have had all the luxuries that he wanted, right? Because his Sahaba were always willing to give him whatever he wanted. Had chosen to live in this simple way, and he had lived in this simple way. SubhanAllah. So what about the food and lifestyle of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam? Aisha anha tells us that the family of Muhammad SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam had not eaten wheat bread to their satisfaction for three consecutive days since his arrival at Medina until he died. SubhanAllah. So something as simple as bread, we think of it as something simple. In those times, it was something valuable, right? It wasn't something that you could easily get all the time. 
And so she's saying that, subhanAllah, the family of Muhammad had not, and she's talking about herself, right? Had not eaten wheat bread to their satisfaction for three days in a row since he arrived at Medina until he died. She also said the Prophet وسلم, died when we had satisfied our hunger with the two black things, dates and water. SubhanAllah. You know, uh, some scholars or teachers sometimes when they explain this hadith, they say the two black things is because, you know, dates and because water, because water used to not be clean in those days, right? But uh, I remember our Sheikh uh, Muhammad Akram Nadwi, he explained to us that no, it's, it's not that. That's not the correct understanding of that phrase. You know, in Arabic is al aswadain, the two black things. Uh, he said, you know, when it comes to in the Arabic language, uh, when you're mentioning two things together and one of them has a certain characteristic, you might give that characteristic to both of them and say al-aswadain, even though it's actually just dates that, is black, that are black, right? So uh, it doesn't mean that the water was dirty, right? As um, I've heard some people say in talks, it's just an expression. It shows you the importance of understanding the Arabic language, right? When you're a student of knowledge, it's really important to study Arabic and to understand its nuances because something that on the face of it so seems very obvious, you have to understand like, you know, a language has certain conventions, certain idioms, just as we do in English, right? There are those kind of um, conventions and idioms, etc., and expressions in Arabic. So uh, the two black things is just a way of talking about two things that are close together or two things that you're mentioning together and she's talking about dates and water so subhanallah look this idea of having cooked food was a luxury for them right so they most of the time this what what this means is that most of the time they were eating raw food they were eating things like dates drinking water maybe having milk even milk is a luxury right milk was seen as a food in those days you know we just treat it as a drink or something to add to our tea or you know something to give the kids or whatever but in those days milk was like a meal right um in the description of their lifestyle we also find that sometimes they would not eat baked or cooked foods for a month uh but we also know that people used to send food to Aisha Radinana and to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a gift. And of course, like, you'd expect that, right? Like, if you knew that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was living in your neighborhood, right, or you had access, any kind of access to him, you would, if you cooked something nice, you'd want to send it, right? And so when people cook something, they would like to send it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and actually they used to especially send it on the day when they knew he was with Aisha. So as you know later on when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had multiple wives uh, he built uh, the same type of hujra for each of them next to in the same area in the same vicinity that side of the masjid right the eastern side and so he would take turns to stay the night with each of his wives. He, he would try to be as just as possible. He was as just as possible. And so what that means is that he would only come to Aisha Anha once every nine days, right? At one point, subhanAllah. So people used to kind of wait until they knew that it was his day to be at Aisha's house because he, they knew how much he loved her and they would wait for that point and that's when they would send some food because it was almost like they wanted to add even more happiness to his happiness right to his joy at being with Aisha and uh, subhanallah so so they did have you know that kind of food they had the food of that was gifts that people would send 
Um, we also know that once a lady from the Ansar gave Aisha anha some kind of a mattress for the Prophet ﷺ. So maybe um, some kind of a uh, leather thing, you know, with a, a bit of a softer filling than palm fibers, right? Something a bit soft. And so Aisha Radilana had put it in her house because uh, obviously that lady had seen that the Prophet Wasallam's mattress was so simple and rough, you know. Um, and so the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, when he saw it, he actually told Aisha that he wanted to have the old mattress back. He said he preferred the simpler mattress, you know. Also, we read that after the Battle of Khaybar, and that was when uh, a lot of date palms and orchards had come into the possession of the Muslims, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allocated a certain amount of dates and a certain amount of barley to be given annually to his wives. Uh, but because of their generosity and the large number of visitors that they used to have, it was not really enough to meet their needs, subhanAllah. Yeah, so I just want us to reflect on that for a little while. And then I want to move on to speaking about Aisha Dilanha's married life. Um, so, like we said, when the Prophet ﷺ was married to a number of women, initially it was just Aisha and Soda, so he would have alternated, right, between them. Um, but later, when he had a number of wives, he would take a day with each of them. And we find in the narrations that Aisha Radilanha really, really uh, wanted the attention of the Prophet And when he was with her, he was, she was very protective over that time, you know, as you'd expect, especially uh, since it's once every nine days, right? Uh, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they knew about the love of Aisha and the Prophet ﷺ, such that even afterwards they would always call her Habiba to Rasulullah. And when, you know, certain troubles started happening amongst the Muslims after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, after the time of Uthman, and somebody said something negative about her, the the Sahaba would defend her and say, are you saying this about Habiba to Rasulullah? Are you saying this about the beloved of Rasulullah? Right? They knew this status that she had, despite the political differences and things that came about later, they would never take away from this status that she had, you know, because it was so well known. And we know that later on, Soda actually gifted her day because she became quite elderly you know she gave her day to Aisha um, her night to Aisha so that means the Prophet ﷺ would spend two nights with Aisha so in looking at her we talked about the different dynamics in looking at her dynamic with the Prophet ﷺ as a wife I thought it would be very interesting to look at a framework that um, uh, I've been looking at with a friend of mine, and that is, uh, you, mu you must have heard of this, it's quite a famous book. It's called uh, The Five Love Languages, right? The Five Love Languages. And the idea in this book is that, <clears throat> that we as human beings, we operate or we have five ways of expressing love okay and usually we have about two of these ways that are stronger for any one of us so uh, for example so that so let me mention what the five love languages are they are words of affirmation okay so saying i love you actually expressing love verbally right um Acts of service, okay, so when we actually do things for one another, uh, for, for some people that is very 
that is a real sign of love, you know, <clears throat> acts of service. Receiving gifts, for some of us, we need to receive gifts in order to feel loved. Quality time, so, you know, we crave quality time with the person that we love or that we want to show us love. Physical touch, for some people it's really important for physical touch to be the primary uh, way to express and receive love. And I think that's five, right? Did I mention five? Yeah. So I thought it would be really interesting to look at, instead of just going through hadiths and saying, you know, look at how the Prophet says, I'm sure I show love. I thought, let's take these five, okay? These five uh, love languages and see if the Prophet وسلم, expressed his love to Aisha through those five modes. And what I found, which is really interesting, is for each one of them, you know, you can find evidence, subhanAllah. So, <clears throat> the first love language words of affirmation, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith, hadith of Amr bin al-As, when he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, which person is most beloved to you? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Aisha, right? Um, and then he said, Amr said, I mean amongst the men. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, her father. And then Amr said, then who? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Umar bin al-Khattab. And then he mentioned other men. SubhanAllah. So I was thinking, SubhanAllah, in this hadith, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not shy to express his love, affirm his love in front of other men, right, who are not related to Aisha, you know, Amr bin al-As, he's not a relative of Aisha or anything. If he's not shy to express and affirm love to his love for Aisha to them, then of course he would have expressed his love and affirmed his love to Aisha in person, right? SubhanAllah, we find in our times and in certain cultures, men find it very kind of, I don't know, kind of embarrassing or something that they don't think is appropriate to express their love for their spouse, right? In fact, in some, <laughs> subhanAllah, in some cultures, people don't even want to mention the name of their spouse, right? In front of other men. Or they would get offended if another man mentioned the name of their wife. But look at the way in this hadith, um, the Prophet وسلم, straight away says Aisha, very openly, right? And clearly, leaving no ambiguity. He didn't say my wife. He didn't say one of my wives. He didn't say my youngest wife or anything like that, you know. He said Aisha, right? And subhanAllah shows you that many of the kind of, I would say, the sense of uh, embarrassment or excessive modesty, you could call it, that sometimes we have in our cultures is not based on the sunnah at all, right? The Prophet ﷺ was open with his love. Of course, he did it with decorum. We're not talking about describing or discussing intimate details of marriage and stuff like that. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly forbade that. But simply for people to know the name of your wife, simply for you to mention the name of your wife, <clears throat> in front of other men, um, for people to know that you love your spouse, there's nothing wrong with that, subhanAllah. So yeah, words of affirmation, the Prophet ﷺ was big on the words of affirmation. Um, and we know that Aisha he would tell her, wouldn't he, about her status, how important she was, how he saw her in a dream before he got married to her, how the angel brought a picture of her in silk, embroidered in silk, and so all of these things are words of affirmation, right? They're affirming his love for her. Okay, so the second love language, acts of service. SubhanAllah. 
Aisha Radilanha tells us that when she was asked, okay, she was asked, what did the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa do in his house? She said, he was a human being like any other. Milk his sheep and serve himself. SubhanAllah. Also in another report, she said, he used to stitch his garment, mend his shoes and work as other men work in their houses. Um, she also said, when she was asked, uh, what did the Prophet Sallallahu do when he was with his family? She said, the Prophet would do chores for his family. And uh, he would go out when it was time for prayer. So SubhanAllah, again, what does this show? It shows us he did acts of service towards for his family, which is an expression of love, right? But also, if you notice how she describes the way that he would be busy doing things, as any man would, you know, in his home or for his family, could be chores inside or outside. But when it came to the Salah, what did he do? He became focused on the Salah, right? He went and prayed. That was his, that, bega that became the number one priority. So in that way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also doing tarbiyah, right, of his family, because he was showing them that yes, there are matters of the dunya, the matters of this world need to be attended to, but when it comes to Allah's rights, when it comes to the time for salah, time to connect with Allah, that becomes the priority, subhanAllah. So the second love language, acts of service, the Prophet Sallallahu certainly did acts of service for his family. The third love language, receiving gifts. Well, <clears throat> I could not find any specific hadiths that talked about gifts that he specifically gave to his wives, okay? But what we do know is that he encouraged the giving of gifts, right? He said, give gifts and you'll love one another, right? Uh, and so of course he will have given gifts. And also we know in the hadith that Aisha Radilana said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, the best of you are the best towards their wives. And I am the best of you to my wives, right? And so that would have included all kinds of good behavior towards your wife, right? So would have included giving gifts as well. And of course the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if he was given a gift he, for his wives, he would have somehow divided it between them, right? If, if it was at all possible. The next love language, quality time. Well, we know that Aisha was very protective over her time with the Prophet ﷺ, and he was very scrupulously fair between his wives in sharing time. Uh, but, you know, he said that, you know, regarding the matters of the heart, so your inclination towards somebody in terms of your love, that's not something you can control, right? But how you express it is something you could control. So even as a parent, right, you might not be able to control how much you, you feel a, an affinity towards one child more than another, right? You love all of your children, but you might have, you might gel more, right, with one child than with another. So you can't, control that, right? Although you would try your best to get on with all of them. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu used to make a dua and he used to say, oh my Lord, this is the share that I can do. In other words, the actual physical being fair between his wives, right? But do not judge me by the share that you can do, which I am not able to do, okay? And uh, the, the scholars said this hadith, this dua was about Aisha. In other words, the Prophet Sallallahu knew that his heart was more inclined towards Aisha. He had more love for her, right? He felt a certain connection with her more than the other wives. And so he was asking Allah to not hold him to account for that matter of the heart, you know? 
he was also very sensitive to her feelings. And one of the ways that we can see that he did care about the quality time he spent with Aisha is that once uh, in one of the ahadith, there's a description of a Persian neighbor who invited the Prophet وسلم, for a meal, right? And, and it was known that this, um, that this neighbor, he would cook very, he would have quite exotic food, you know, for that time. And he invited the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent somebody to invite the Prophet. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, uh, is she invited as well? Is Aisha invited as well? And the person, maybe it was a servant or something, he, kept, he said, no, okay? So then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declined. He actually turned down the offer, right? Um, and then the servant came again and he said uh, that this man, you know, this neighbor, he invites you. And the Prophet said, is she, is she also invited? And he said, no. So then he said, uh, then I must decline the offer. So then he went. And for the third time he came back, so maybe his master was like, you know, go and make sure the Prophet comes, right? And um, he said, you know, the so-and-so invites you to his house for a meal. And he said, is she invited? And this time the servant said, yes, she is. So the master must have given permission and realized that the Prophet actually wanted to do something with his wife, not without her, right? Wanted to have this meal with his wife. So when the servant said yes, then the Prophet ﷺ accepted that invitation. And both the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha went to enjoy that meal. So subhanAllah, that lovely story, it kind of shows you that the Prophet ﷺ was very sensitive to the fact that this was Aisha's time, you know, um, and that if he was going to go and eat with somebody else, then that would mean less time with her, right? He wouldn't be spending that enjoying, he wouldn't be enjoying it with her. She wouldn't be having a nice meal like he would be. And also he wouldn't be spending that time with her, right? So he wanted to arrange it such that she would also be part of it or that he would stay at home and spend his time with her. And it also shows you you're allowed to turn down an invitation, you know, if you have a reason for it and, you know, it's not obligatory for you to accept every single invitation. And it also shows you uh, that if you want to invite, so if you want somebody else to be invited, somebody invites you, you can't just turn up there, right? You can't just turn up with your wife or with your family. You should have the other to ask if you want to, if you want somebody else to be invited as well, you should have the other to ask. And if they say no, you should accept it. It's not, you should not hold that against them. You know, so subhanAllah, you can see from this that the Prophet ﷺ really cared about his quality time with Aisha. The fourth or fifth love language. Okay, so we've been through words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time. And the last one is physical touch, right? We know that the Prophet ﷺ kissed Aisha radiallahu right? She tells us herself. Aisha radiallahu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kissed some of his wives and then he left for the salah without renewing his ablution, without renewing his wudu. So obviously she was telling this hadith to her nephew Urwa ibn al-Zubair. She was telling it to him as a point of fiqh, right? She was telling him that, oh, look, you don't have to make wudu if you kiss your wife, if you have physical contact with your wife, you don't, or even kissing, which is seen as like a affectionate or could be even seen as a sexual thing, right? Um, she said that, um, you know, he would kiss his wife and then go for salah. He didn't kiss his wife and then go and make wudu because his wudu was broken or something, right? And so um, she mentioned this for this point of benefit, this fiqhi benefit. And her nephew Urwa said to her, oh, who was this wife if it was not you? Yani, 
you're saying, I know you're talking about yourself. He kissed you, right? And then he went for salah. And at this, his auntie, Aisha, she laughed. His khala, Aisha, laughed. <laughs> Subhanallah. Okay. And uh, this hadith is in Tirmidhi. And Tirmidhi comments that it is the opinion of Sufyan al and the people of Kufa that there is no obligatory ablution after kissing, right? So he's talking about, when they say Sufyan al and the people of Kufa, especially the people of Kufa, they mean like the Hanafis basically, right? Um, that, you know, it's their opinion that uh, you don't have to make wudu after kissing. So, so we see from this hadith that definitely the Prophet Sallallahu you know, showed his love through kissing and also through touching. We know that Aisha Radhilana said that when um, she was on her menses or when a woman is on her menses, then the Prophet Sallallahu considered everything above the navel to be allowed to be touched and enjoyed, right? Between the spouses, right? Um, and uh, so we know from that, that of course the Prophet وسلم, would have expressed his love through physical touch, right? We also, I'm just going to mention a few more examples of their love for one another. We see her protectiveness over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Once, you know, a group of people had entered upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some of the Ahlul Kitab, people of the book. And so this, this was in her house, right? And she heard them say, Assalamu alaikum. She heard them say, death be upon you. This was a trick that the, uh, the, the Jews of Medina used to do sometimes, where when they would enter upon the Prophet Sallallahu instead of saying, Assalamu alaikum, they would say, Assalamu alaikum as a type of curse or something like this, right? And Aisha radiallahu anha, she heard and understood it. And immediately she stood up and she said, Wa alaykum sam wa la'an, right? She said, and may death and the curse of Allah be upon you as well, right? And <clears throat> Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, be calm, O Aisha. Allah loves that one should be kind and lenient in all man matters. And then Aisha said, Oh Allah's Messenger, haven't you heard what they have said? Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have already said to them, Wa alaykum, I've also already said, and upon you. Right? So whatever you said upon me, upon you too. So in other words, he was showing Aisha, first of all, you can see from this hadith, the protectiveness that Aisha had for the Prophet ﷺ, that somebody's insulting him or saying something against him. She felt very protective about that and felt like defending him, right? Uh, but it also shows you the tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ for Aisha, right? He's giving her tarbiyah. Don't get stressed out. <laughs> no need to get angry. No need to get, you know, stressed and kind of lose your sense of decorum. There's no need for that, right? Uh, we don't need to insult them back. We just can say, Wa alaykum, and upon you. Whatever you said to me is upon you as well, right? So, subhanAllah, we see the tarbiyah of the Prophet. Also, an example, another example of her love. You know, she had a lot of ghira for the Prophet, sense of protective jealousy. Um, she said herself in the hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. I never felt jealous of any woman as I did of Khadija. Anha, though she had died three years before the Prophet married me. And that was because I heard him mentioning her too often. And because his Lord had ordered him to give her the glad tidings that she would have a palace in paradise made of qasr. And because she, he used to slaughter a sheep and distribute its meat among her friends. So she was so protective in her sense of jealousy. She had a protective jealousy for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam known as Ghira, Ghira or Ghaira. 
that you know this constant mention of uh, Khadija and knowing how much he held her in a high esteem was something that would cause her a sense of jealousy, right? It was something that would cause her a sense of jealousy. But at the same time, she did not transgress the bounds, you know? Uh, this is another sign of her love. Inshallah, with this point, I will uh, move to Q&A. Another sign of her love is that she did not transgress the bounds when she was pleased or displeased with the Prophet Now you might say, how can somebody be displeased with the Prophet right? Well, of course, for an average person, an average Muslim, if an average Muslim was displeased with the Prophet this would, could be an act of kufr, right? This could be an act of disbelief. But we're talking about the husband and wife relationship. And in that, there was some leeway given, you know, because there's natural, there's a natural type of, you know, positive and negativity, right? That, that comes with marriage, right? With living with somebody constantly in that way. So we see in this hadith that Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, he said to Aisha, I know whether you are angry or pleased with me. And uh, Aisha said, how do you know that, Allah's Messenger? He said, when you are pleased, you say, yes, by the Lord of Muhammad. But when you are angry, you say, no, by the Lord of Ibrahim. I said, yes, I do not leave except your name. She said, the only thing I leave out is your name, right? So, subhanAllah, uh, you can see that she didn't use to transgress the bounds there's these subtle things that would express whether she was happy or sad about something. Um, and inshallah, uh, next time we will carry on with some other examples of her love. Aisha as student and protector of the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha as mentee and Aisha as friend. Uh, I wanted to finish those off, so we'll leave that for next time. And if we get time, we will talk about the verses of hijab, the way that hijab was uh, revealed, and uh, you know what Aisha has response and her attitude was towards the hijab in general. Uh, so, if there are any questions, we can go to those now. There are any questions, please. Please do ask them or if you have any comments. Inshallah, next week this class will also be at 5 p.m. So do tell you know as many sisters as you can so that more and more sisters can join us. Um, I've also done an analysis, actually, which you're going to find interesting, of Aisha Adhan's personality. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the five uh, big personality traits, right? So psychologists today, they say that there are five big uh, kind of personality traits that everyone has, or uh, everyone has certain percentages of these personality, personality traits, right? And those five are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, right? And um, it might sound like a bit of a unconventional thing to do, but I just got really curious, you know, looking at the life of Aisha and studying so many of her hadiths and, you know, looking at her in, in so many different areas of her life, I started to kind of think, okay, you know, we actually get a very good idea as much as we can as people who are looking back at history, right, of Aisha Radilanha's personality. And so I actually did a little bit of analysis of her personality. Inshallah, it would be interesting to share 
the results. And this is obviously based on what we know about her, right? Nobody can really do a proper personality test on anyone um, unless that person themselves sits, sits down and answers the questions necessary, right? But I think from all of the body of literature that we have, right? If you look at the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, right? He has the Musnad of Aisha, which is like all of the Hadiths of Aisha. And it's the volumes, right? I believe it's at least four volumes, if not more. And so just looking through that, of course you get, you form a picture of her personality from all of that. And so I thought it would be interesting to share her personality. If you get a chance before next session, you could look those five personality traits up and uh, tell me what you think, you know, when we discuss this topic. Was Aisha Radilanha an extrovert or an introvert? Was she high in agreeableness? Was she high in uh, conscientiousness? You know, conscientiousness can be like being orderly, being very kind of aware of the little details, right? Um, was she high in openness? Was she... Now, neuroticism doesn't mean, it's not necessarily a negative trait. It means basically that you highly analyze and highly stew over things and, you know, worry about things, right? So was she high in that? Uh, I'd like you to think about this. It's just an interesting thing, I think, for us to, to think about. It's not, it's not something that's going to have any bearing on our fiqh or anything like that. Okay. So, let me see what the sisters are saying. Jazakallah khairan for the class. Your sessions are always so detailed and fun. Oh, alhamdulillah. I'm glad you think so. I love this session. I wanted to ask the name of the book of the House of the Messenger of Allah. Okay. Do you know what? I think I've got it here. Let me just reach down and get it. Oh, where is it? Hmm. I think I might have left it downstairs, I'm afraid. So, please... Um, I, I will get it for you next time. I've forgotten the name as well. Uh, let me write that down so that I don't forget. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khairan for the du'as, everyone. I really appreciate it. What is Aisha's kunya? Was she widely known by it or used in her time? Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, it's Um Abdullah, right? The mother of Abdullah, that was Abdullah bin Az-Zubayr, her nephew. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how widely people used it, but it was the kunya that the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged her to use when she was very aware that she didn't have kids and the other people had kunyas, right? Um, This lesson really made me feel the human nature of the messenger and Aisha. I think it's often robot roboticized, where it's like they were just worshiping Allah without any human feelings in between. Yes. You know, uh, my husband makes a joke when, when people are looking for marriage and you know, they say, is it okay for me to marry somebody who I find attractive? You know, like people seem to think that it's kind of sinful to want to have love and attraction, right? They think when we're getting married, we have to just look at only the Islamic kind of character, right? And uh, a joke that my husband often says is, <laughs> I can't say it in the way that he says it because it's a bit rude, but um, basically he says, you know, piety alone doesn't doesn't make a good marriage, you know? Piety alone doesn't make a good marriage. It doesn't make the sparks fly, right, in a marriage. Um, you need the attraction as well there, right? It's important. So you can see that there was definitely attraction there between the Prophet Sallallahu and Aisha. Um, and, and you're right about the roboticized thing, because sometimes when I've been reading some of the books about Aisha Radilanha and the way that the scholars have written about their marriage, there's always a section that says, 
the real reason why the Prophet loved Aisha, right? And then there's just this list of the fact that she was, she worshipped Allah, right? Now, although that's true, it's true, you know, and we will see, inshallah, in future episodes, we will see how much Aisha Radhanan had loved the Prophet, but also how much she worshipped Allah. She was a true worshipper of Allah. That's true. But to take away any kind of human dynamic <clears throat> and to act as though the reason why the Prophet loved Aisha was because of her piety when she was like really young, right? You couldn't say that she's like, she learnt about piety while she was living with the Prophet. She didn't come to him as a fully formed, pious person. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course, she had very good qualities from the beginning, but when you're nine years old, you know, you're still developing, right? So to kind of limit the Prophet Sallallahu personality to only caring about piety, it's, it's kind of, like you said, robotic and it's unrealistic. He must have loved Aisha because she was attractive, right? He loved her because she was beautiful, because she loved him, because she expressed love, because of her personality, because they gelled, because they were on the same wavelength because she obeyed him, because she served him, because she showed love to him. Because of all of these five love languages that we mentioned, you know, things that he did for her and she did for him. So to limit their marriage to only being about worship and is to limit uh, the true personality of the Prophet Sallallahu So I think you're right about that. like the way you use the five love languages to portray the love between Aisha. Yeah, because you can see the, how, mashallah, the Prophet Sallallahu really, you know, expressed love in so many different ways. What is the name of this, of the set of Aisha's hadiths? So, you know, different hadith collections, they order their hadiths in different ways, okay? A musnad is basically a hadith collection that that puts the hadiths of one Sahabi all together, right? So all the hadiths of Abu Bakr are together, all the hadiths of Umar, all the hadiths of Aisha, etc., etc. So the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the famous Musnad of Imam Ahmad, uh, that's like the most famous, I would say, Musnad, that um, is a great resource if you really want to know about Aisha and you want to feel like you know her and you can hear her voice <laughs> and understand her, right? <clears throat> Go to the Musnad of Imam Ahmed and you could look it up in Arabic as Musnad of Aisha, Musnad Aisha. It might come up um, because, you know, each of the, the Musnad is divided into the Musnad of each Sahabi, basically, right? Um, but it's in Arabic, that's the thing. When you cover hijab, could you also please cover the topic of how Aisha had guarded her taqwa and chastity since the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away early in her life? Indeed. Mm, that's something people don't think about, right? Uh, also to confirm, is it permissible to illustrate animals, animated beings for children's content only? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. Uh, I do know from as a person who buys books, so you're not the one who's actually drawing those things, as somebody who buys them, I know it's permissible, I believe that it's permissible to buy those types of books for children. Um, but in terms of being an artist who actually draws them, that's a very good question. Inshallah, I will do my best to, to look that up. Um, personally, I, I avoid that myself, but uh, I will look into it, inshallah, um, to try to give you a better answer, uh, an accurate answer, inshallah. Zakumullah khairan. Inshallah, I'm going to end it there because I want to, you know, us to end on time, as close to time as possible. Zakumullah khairan, sisters, I really appreciate you coming and attending this class week after week. Please share it with others, you know, share this link. The link is permanent now, so we're not going to keep changing it. The link is permanent and it's 5 p.m., Share it with everybody, inshallah, all your friends, your family, 
give them a little nudge a few minutes before it starts because I think sometimes you know people intend to attend and then they just forget about it and tell them how much more interesting it is to attend live because when you attend live you can actually I feel like you're all part of this class you know you've helped form this class Jazakumullah khair and your observations are amazing so I really do appreciate that may Allah bless all of you may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us with our mother Aisha in Jannah inshallah uh, with that, I will uh, bid you farewell, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.